example, there are multiple numbers for any given year. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, as, so one has to have some criteria for deciding what the numbers are, but even if you have that, uh, and Dininger and Squire did uh, try to come up with a set of numbers that would be, that they, they considered to be their high quality numbers, uh, the two things are ha happen. One is that this data set becomes even more sparse than it was before, more gaps. And secondly, uh, it's, uh, it's still very hard to interpret or to find anything that would be particularly useful uh, in these numbers. So the problem that we faced was that to be even begin on the kind of project that we were interested in, uh, we had to come up with another way of, uh, of collecting information about economic inequality. Uh, we were um, uh, motivated also by a complete lack of funds. So in addition to grubbing around in a low prestige area, we were also working on a shoestring. Uh, and the available information for us was largely administrative data, uh, which could be uh, either payroll data uh, by, uh, with employment by, let's say, industry or by sector or by region. Uh, or it could be income data and population data, uh, again, by, by region. And what we uh, decided to do with this information was to compute a component of Tiles T statistic, uh, which is a measure of, in of inequality that is based on the work of Claude Shannon in information theory uh, and uh, is exceedingly easy to compute. Uh, it essentially measures the inequality between any set of groups that are uh, mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive of whatever population group you're attempting to, uh, attempting to measure. Now, inequality across groups is not inequality across individuals, but the more finely divided your group structure is, the closer you get to the individual level, and the more likely it is that you're uh, your measures will actually behave in a way that's quite similar to what they what would happen if you had a a, a, a very accurate random sample or a complete census. Uh, the advantage of this approach is, first of all, uh, that it that the accuracy converges very quickly uh, to a to a re reliable micro level data set. You can with a very very uh, coarse resolution in the, in the in a disaggregation of the group structure, you can in fact uh, get measures which uh, broadly speaking are very similar to what uh, the benchmark measures you have for the, for, for the most reliably sampled countries. And secondly, uh, the data are immensely easy to get. They're very, very uh, widespread and available at essentially at very, very nominal cost or very often at no cost at all. Uh, so, uh, the mathematics of it are totally straightforward. There's a between groups component of a between groups component of tiles T statistic, which is basically the the ratio of an individual income to the group average times the log of the same thing summed over individuals divided by the number of individuals in the group. You can add up the uh, within group measures, weighting them by the uh, by the income of the group. Uh, to get that, let's get a term here, but we don't use any of that. All we use is the between groups component, which is this term. And that for your group, for any given group, is the ratio of the group average income to the average income of the population as a whole, the log of that same term, and weighted by the population share of the group. So if, a, if an entity has the zero population weighted, that's nothing to inequality. If its income is same as the group average, the log term is zero, and that adds nothing to inequality. Otherwise, it either has a positive or a negative effect, depending upon whether it's above or below uh, the average income of the population as a whole. You compute that measure for every group, and you sum it up, and that's the measure that we're using, between groups component of Tiles T statistic. It's exceedingly simple, and every you know, can be implemented on spreadsheets, and any, any uh, graduate student obviously can pick it up in a matter of minutes. Uh, and it's extremely powerful. Just to give you one example uh, that uh, uh, Isabella will be familiar with, <laughs> a state from the State Statistical Yearbook of the People's Republic of China, which gives you measures across industries and regions, across sectors and regions, uh, going back in this case, I guess, to 1987. 
um, and um, they uh, uh, were able to decompose that into measures of inequality across regions and across sectors. So there's a measure across regions, there's a measure across sectors, uh, and you can see how uh, the inequality rises through the period of liberalization in the early 1990s, but then peaks out in the 2000s across regions and peaks out at the time of the great crisis in 2008 across sectors. Uh, so those two things happen uh, somewhat distinctly. When you sum them up, you've got a measure for the inequality of the country as a whole, rising very sharply from the late 80s until about 2005 or so, and then stabilizing and declining a bit afterwards, which is in fact entirely consistent with what survey data show. And the difference is that it doesn't cost us anything to compute this. We have this for every year, and we can calculate it within minutes of receiving the data from the state statistical yearbook, rather than with a lag of some years as it takes to collect and collate the surveys. And a further advantage is that you can, and this is just, uh, sorry, regions and sectors, is that you can, um, uh, you can actually map out where the inequality is, the inequality is, is uh, affecting the country, of how it's playing out across the surface of the country. Uh, and the, just to give you a, a, a difference of a decade from 87 to 97, typically with the survey data, you'll see, they'll talk about the coastal regions and the inland regions in very vague terms because they're looking at, uh, at samples that are uh, essentially only, uh, they don't have a lot of disaggregation here and they're not looking at an enormous number of, of, of cases. Uh, but with this, you can see very clearly uh, how it was that the, what, what everybody knows, which is, is the uh, major urban region of municipality of Beijing. Shanghai is too show, small to show up on this map, but then Guangdong province emerged as the, initially in the early period as the major uh, income gainers and the laggards are the, obviously the Northeastern regions uh, in Heilongjiang and so forth and the Southwest, which is uh, Sichuan and so forth. So it, you can see what, what is, what is no, no secret to anybody who knows something about political geography of China just emerges very clearly and distinctly in this kind of analysis. So that's what you could do. We did this for many, many countries individually, for China, for Russia, uh, for the European Union in various, various ways, including across uh, nuts one geographic regions and, and, and in great detail for the United States, which I'll come to. Um, but uh, the objective of the exercise was, uh, as it developed, I mean, as we began to realize that we had uh, a fairly powerful hammer in our hands. And of course, as, as well known, when that happens, everything starts to look like a nail. Uh, we start asking ourselves, where can we find information that would be broadly comprehensive for the world as a whole? And the answer was the United Nations Inter uh, Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, uh, which gave us the opportunity to, to draw their uh, industrial statistics, uh, which are collected on a consistent basis uh, for, uh, uh, well, about 200 and some 220 some countries, uh, although not consistently over time for all of them, consistently enough over time for a fairly large number, uh, that we could then uh, begin to compute these measures in a kind of wholesale way and develop a global data set. Uh, so uh, it's, it's now somewhat, uh, I think we now have data, I said 2011, I think we now have it up to 2014. And I've unfortunately run out of students, so updating from this point is gonna be a little bit of a, of a challenge, but uh, the fact is enough is there to give you a picture of, of what one can learn from looking at this information over, uh, it's almost a 50 or a somewhat 50 year period. And the, the total scale of the data set is now 154 countries has more than 4,000 separate country year observations, each of which is computed from information that is specific to that country and that year. There's no imputation across countries or across years, uh, which is the major difference between our data set and the uh, SWI ID of Frederick Salt at the University of Iowa. Uh, it's much more comprehensive than the OECD, obviously, which is limited to the rich countries, to the Luxembourg Income Study, which is very good, but limited to countries for which there, is, uh, there are good sample surveys, or even the World Bank, which is restricted to what the country, member countries actually tell it. Uh, and. Uh, in this case, we're looking at information which is, uh, was never intended to be used to measure inequality. So it, there's no risk that it is being distorted 
in some way for political purposes. Um, and if this, although there's only one concept here, and I'll come to that, that's being reported, uh, it is the largest single concept inequality data set uh, that is available anywhere. Uh, and uh, what it is, uh, is uh, actually a two-step process here. The first thing that we did was to compute the tile statistics, and that's the UTIP UNIDO data set, uh, from across industrial categories. Uh, and then we say, okay, the tile statistics very good, but it's not particularly intuitive. People don't really know what a measure of 0.034 means. Uh, and it actually doesn't mean anything at all, and, except in a relation to the, the trend across time or the levels between different countries. So can we translate this into a language that is more familiar to the profession than specifically to the, to the language of the Gini coefficient where everything's nicely standardized between zero and one or zero and 100. Uh, and, uh, and the answer to that was yes, we could. Uh, that, uh, with that, this is where, where the simple regression uh, analysis, uh, a simple regression analysis comes in. And we could take our measure that we computed ourselves of inequality across industrial sectors and use it as, an, as, an in, as, a, as, a, as a variable essentially to explain the movement of, of a Gini coefficient. So we took a set of matched data, about 400 observations actually drawn from the, uh, from the Dynager and Squire data set, uh, 430 observations uh, of, that, of theirs, of their so high quality data set. Uh, and match them exactly to our measures uh, and uh, control for three major types of data that are in the Dynager and Squire data, whether it's an income measure or a consumption measure, whether it's a household income measure or a personal income measure, whether it's gross of tax or net of tax, gross income or disposable income. So those are the three um, uh, dummy variables that are all here, they're all very significant, have the signs you would expect. Uh, and then our measure of uh, uh, the tile statistic, which turns out is a very close uh, correlate of the, uh, of the income inequality measures. And so what we found in fact was that Diners and Squires data, once you controlled for what kind of data, what kind of measure, what kind of concept was actually pretty good. Uh, and the other, the other thing that made a big difference was uh, the ratio of manufacturing to population, uh, manufacturing employment to population, easily computed uh, and uh, something that tells you something about the degree of industrialization in the country. Uh, and overall between that, uh, those, those variables, you can pick up a little more than half of the variance uh, in the whole uh, 430 observations uh, that from this from this data, uh, and uh, then we thought, okay, well, we've got these two coefficients on uh, the LN final, the tile statistic, and the and the manufacturing population. We'll use them as uh, as beta hats, essentially, as as uh, estimators uh, for to expand our using our raw material, those two variables, essentially, to compute an estimated Gini coefficient for gross household income inequality, and that's what. Uh, they, they estimated this data set, the second data set, estimated household income inequality data set does. Um, so there's our, that's the coefficient that matters there. And so in addition to having a, a direct measure of inequality across industrial sectors, which may or may not be what you're directly interested in for whatever research purpose you may have, we also computed a measure which is essentially estimated household income inequality, also over 4,000 estimates uh, for 150 or countries. And as I said, that's the other slide was a little bit out of date. The actual years now covered it, go up to 2014. Uh, so um, the question then is, are the data any good? Uh, do they correspond to what is being measured by other um, uh, sources in, in the literature? And I, I'm not going to go into that in detail because it would take up too much time, I think, right now, but I could show you in the question and answer period. We did a fairly exhaustive comparison of our measures with the published literature on maybe 30 or 40 countries uh, in, in North America, and Africa, Latin America, uh, Asia, uh, uh, all across the world, essentially. Uh, and what we found was that, yes, in general, this model worked extremely well, uh, very, very well for the advanced countries, very well for the transition countries in Eastern Europe and former Soviet space, um, and pretty well on the whole for developing countries where the survey data is really very regular. 
uh, the, uh, uh, some cases where our measures cut well below, uh, for, particularly for some large developing countries, well below the, the, the estimates that are in the literature of South Africa, Brazil are examples. But on the whole, for a two variable model, it turns out that industrial pay and the degree of industrialization gets you a very long way to understanding uh, what the, both the level and the movement of gross income inequality is across countries around the world. And uh, the advantage is that this is a, you have a, a single consistent series, so you can extract patterns from the, from, the, uh, from the common movement of these series. So I would come to that. Let me show you what the data look like. Uh, and what, this is, these are maps which are, uh, are computed um, by, um, by decades, so decade by decade average enables you to get a certain amount of coverage and a color coding from the cool blues to the hot oranges and reds of the levels of income inequality for, this, for the 1960s. Uh, and there, again, the, 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 no surprises here, and one would hope not to be surprised. You find that the low income inequality countries are in North America and Northern Europe uh, and Oceania, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, the high income inequality countries are, are the underdeveloped, uh, under less developed countries of the tropics. Uh, and this it corresponds to the fact that the industrial countries have industrial middle classes, uh, which gives them a lo an advantage of lower, lower inequality, uh, whereas the, uh, the rest of the world was by and large dual economies uh, with uh, small numbers of very wealthy people, perhaps associated with mining and large numbers of very poor people associated with agriculture. Not surprised, but it, there it is. The data are remarkably consistent. And if you compare it to other data sets, you'll find the level of consistency is really an improvement uh, over what you'll see. Uh, the other thing which is important here to notice is that countries which are near to each other do, should have and do have relatively similar measures, which given that you have porous borders uh, and interconnections is, should also not be a surprise. Uh, but in the 1970s, already inequality is rising in the United States, uh, and it's rising, it rises in the 80s, and you can see in the 1990s in particular, the picture changes, of course, the Soviet space comes into the data, um, and um, in the 2000s. In the 2000s, with the exception of a number of countries in North Europe, Basically, the whole world has the inequality coloration of the of, of the um, um, non-Western world in the 1960s. Essentially, it's a, it's not that the world is poorer; uh, it doesn't have the same level of poverty, but the stretch between the wealthy and the and the, and the less wealthy is about comparable to what was characteristic of the uh, of of the developing world 50 years previously. Uh, that's a crucial finding. But again, the all through this, the consistency of movement across uh, space. Uh, and through time uh, is, I think, a point to, in favor of the general credibility of the measures. Um, and I'll say, just to come back, I think I put another couple of slides in to give you the contrast here, the 1960s and the 2000s. So you can see quite vividly um, how much uh, the world has changed over the, in this respect in this 50 year period. I want to just go briefly, if it will come up here, yes, it does, uh, to the uh, uh, brand new, uh, just in the last few weeks, uh, updated version of the, of, the, of the website that we uh, 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 have uh, here on the, uh, from the Inequality Project, which very, very nicely done by a, a student in uh, information uh, science. Uh, over about a year, uh, which enables one basically to pick any time period uh, and then read the uh, the inequality measures off of the off of the data and just to move over what four year intervals uh, to see the evolution of things over time. So that I uh, I'm 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 really quite proud of this work. Is and the work of a. Of, of several generations, actually in multiple cohorts of, of PhD students to, uh, uh, and, and master students to both develop the data set, uh, which requires a fair amount of, 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 of care with the underlying data to avoid problems that come up when you have slight gaps in the, uh, an industry measure is missing for a given year, so forth. Uh, it's very sensitive to that kind of problem, but to get consistent and, and, and I think reliable measures 
on the global scale. It's an achievement that uh, they deserve a lot of credit for. Okay. Um, just to give you one um, of uh, many different uh, macroeconomic implications of this, uh, one can, uh, I said, I, did I actually, hold on a second, let's see if, now never mind. Uh, one piece of work that we did was to look at the relationship between these inequality measures, and actually, I think these are the tile measures that, that makes a difference, uh, the, and, 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 and exchange rate simulation to the dollar. On the thesis that uh, what we're looking at here are measures that are, um, uh, are, are highly sensitive uh, to a country's um, trading position. Uh, in particular, countries have basically their, they either, you can either export a product or you can sell it in your internal market. If you export it uh, and your country suffers a devaluation, the exporters don't suffer because their income comes in, in in foreign currency and is immediately revalued in the local currency, but everybody else does suffer. And since exporters tend to have higher incomes than people who don't export, expect a, a positive correlation with the ex between the exchange rate. A sign, if you like, of the power over internal inequality of external and global finance. Uh, and which was sort of, okay, can we test this hypothesis country by country? The answer is for rich countries and poor countries and big countries and small countries and close countries and uh, even a far country, though China is not such a great example here, uh, countries that are not so connected to the US, countries, uh, large countries, Ireland, Mexico. Mexico is the prime case where the correlation is almost perfect, like over 90, 95% or so. Uh, the fact is that what you're, if you want a single thing that explains for many countries the movement of inequality internally, it's whether the currency is uh, it's subject to crisis with respect to the dollar. Uh, that, that, uh, it's what's driving uh, the, the income differentials that you can measure, especially in the industrial sector, even for a country like Romania. Uh, there are exceptions. There are a handful of sessions, Russia, South Africa, uh, uh, some of the some of the relationships are tighter than others. Not surprisingly, some countries are major trader partners, isn't the U.S. at all, but Germany, for example, or Japan. Uh, but by and large, uh, it tells you that there is a global and financial and macroeconomic uh, component to what's going on. In, uh, and I, I'm, I'm a Italy is an exception. That's from the period before the the euro, obviously. Um, okay. All right, um, there was a, something that I missed here that I'll come back to because I wanted to show you a, um, a trend uh, which is extracted from the whole data set. Uh, and let me see if I can find it, if it's still in this. I edited some things out, so if it's still in this, I'll, I'll dig it out. It might be have just gotten hidden. No, it didn't. Um, let me go and... Uh, no, never mind. I will find it later. Um, now let's come back here. Yep. yep. Now we have an unexpected error. Come on. Okay, back to this. Um, let's go back to this one. And I want to switch gears at this point and talk about the second uh, area, the second area in which the same general body of research uh, can uh, give us some insights. And this is where I ask the question, okay, we have lots and lots of data for the United States uh, and we can in fact build a parallel data set that gives us annual measures of income inequality for every state in the United States going back to 1969 and does it very reliably, which is an advantage over what was previously available because up until 2000, uh, the only way you could get, the only annual measures for income inequality for the states were at the decennial census. Basically the current population survey had too small a sample size for places like North Dakota, or Rhode Island or so forth. So they didn't have that. 
they now have it post 2000. Uh, but by uh, using employment and earnings data in the same essentially identical technique uh, and calibrating it to the decennial census, we constructed a consistent set of series for every American state. Uh, question is, of what use is the inequality measure for American states? The answer to that is, well, uh, one piece of information that is uh, 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 that happens, or one set of events that happens at the state level in the United States are presidential elections, which are not resolved by popular vote, but by a majority in each state as uh, decided in the Electoral College. And so the question that we asked was, uh, can one an association between uh, income inequality in the states and uh, the outcomes of presidential elections. Uh, and so a paper that um, my last doctoral student, Jehi Choi, uh, has, I have just published in Structural Change and Economic Dynamics, uh, takes up that question. If you look at the vote in 2016, you've got a pattern by county, blues and reds, like this. And you say, okay, well, and there's some things going on here. Uh, but you can observe that uh, the, uh, the counties that were won by Secretary Clinton uh, were of perhaps of two types. Uh, they're relatively wealthy counties, uh, for example, in the California coast. And of course, some of the impoverished ones, for example, down here in South Texas or here in the Mississippi uh, Valley or along uh, the deep south of the Appalachian Highlands. So uh, the hypothesis that we uh, offered is that, uh, uh, that and I'll come out to the, to the, to the nut of the matter, is that, um, that the, uh, the Democratic Party is a coalition of uh, essentially voting blocks in, two, in the two tails of the distribution, that is, like upper income urban professionals on the one side and lower income minorities, immigrants uh, on the other side. Uh, and that the Republican Party uh, is essentially a block of voters uh, who are occupy positions in the middle of the income distribution. And if that is true, then it's a very simple proposition uh, that the, uh, uh, the more unequal a state, uh, the, the fatter the tails of the distribution, the more likely that state is to be a democratic state and the more likely it is to cast its electoral votes uh, for the democratic candidate. Uh, so that was the, the very sort of the basis of the idea of and then this piece of work. Uh, and you can uh, basically divide the world into three groups, divide the country into three groups, and assign them with arbitrarily or you know, guesses at what their voting propensities are. Uh, and uh, for example, the lower income democratic constituency, whether the African Americans about uh, nine to one uh, Democratics, uh, Hispanic Americans about seven to three, so we call it eight to eight to two on average. Uh, the Republican uh, majorities tend to be quite high in the middle income districts. And again, the Democratic ones in the wealthier urban districts also quite high. Uh, and you can then calculate out sort of as a, for various, various um, uh, types of, of um, uh, population distributions in the states, what you would expect the vote share to be for the Democrats or the Republicans. So these are again, these are not, th th these numbers are not data rooted. They're just sort of give you an idea of how, uh, how we're, we're, we're thinking about the, this problem. Then the question is, does, it, um, uh, does, does this produce a, a, a relationship uh, between the uh, inequality in a state and the chances that it will vote for one party or the other? Uh, and if so, is this a relationship? When does it develop? Uh, if you go back to the 1970s, the most unequal states in that were in the, in the United States were in the Deep South. Uh, and those states were, of course, they were solidly democratic. Uh, but there's no, very hard to find a general relationship between the inequality uh, of, uh, 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 there is a little one here, you can see, but it's uh, between the inequality in a state and its overall voting outcome. This is the Ford Carter election of 1976. Uh, but things change and things change dramatically over the course of uh, globalization, financialization, and deindustrialization of the American economy. Uh, and one can see this change develop over time uh, by looking at the measures of inequality uh, as they, and as they relate 
to electoral outcomes. So this is the, I'm just using the tile, we have both tile and Gini measures in the paper, I'm just using the tile measures here. You can see that already in the election of the Gore-Bush election of 2000, the states that had uh, larger increases in the inequality measures were tending to go for Gore. The states that were had less were tending to go to Bush. In 2004, the Kerry-Bush election, the pattern is still there, even more pronounced. Uh, in 2012, it's even more pronounced. I skip over the landslide election of 2008 and other, other you know, landslide elections. But when you're looking at an election where you have a close outcome uh, or a closer outcome, and you can see this extremely clearly. And then you come up to the critical election of 2016. Uh, and it turns out that the 14 states with the largest increases in inequality uh, after 1969 or after 1990, in fact, uh, uh, all voted for Hillary Clinton. And the states with the smaller increases in inequality, uh, generally speaking, except for some small ones here, voted for Trump. Um, so one has uh, a pattern in the data which rather strongly corresponds to the hypothesis uh, that the more unequal a state, uh, the larger the, the dispersion of incomes, the more likely it is to have a majority that is composed on the one hand of wealthy people and on the other hand of people who are not wealthy at all. And the more equal a state, the more it's likely to be a kind of common suburban, mostly white, uh, uh, not terribly industrial, not dominated by finance or technology, not coastal uh, state, the more likely that's going to be a Trump state. Uh, that suggests to us that, uh, that when you're looking at what's about to happen in the next uh, uh, few weeks, uh, that the patterns are not governed very much by events, but very much uh, by changing demography. And there, of course, you have an interesting development, which is that uh, uh, things are moving in two different directions. One is that uh, in the case of the states uh, that Trump won narrowly, Pennsylvania, for example, uh, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, crucial states, uh, the drift is against the Democrats because the states are not, uh, their, their low income populations are somewhat elderly and they're also being, the votes are being suppressed. Uh, and there's not a, a, a lot of, of, uh, of development of new high income uh, centers there. Uh, whereas across the South and Southwest, Arizona, uh, Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, uh, the, the movement goes very much in the direction of the Democrats because you have both uh, increases in upper income urban populations and strong increases uh, in minority populations, particularly Hispanic voting. Uh, now, whether, they, whether that's big enough of a movement in the South and Southwest to flip states, it probably is in Arizona, may not be anywhere else, is an interesting question. But our hypothesis would be that just on the basis that's very simple uh, analysis and data uh, inspection, uh, you can pretty much get a pretty good idea of what the underlying dynamics of American presidential politics are these days. Uh, and you can see that the, this just gives you a sense of how significant these changes have been. And when they happen, they happen essentially with the Clinton election in 1992 and the coefficient uh, 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 is, is, is significant and outside the Arab ends, uh from that point forward in every election, uh, whether using basing it at 69 or 1990, same story. Um, and just to give you, a, again, the same, to give you this story with a few examples, uh, you can see how as California moves up, this is the rankings of inequality. From 1972 was the 21st most unequal state. And that was Republican through 1988, turned Democratic and has been Democratic ever since. It's now the second most unequal state. New York, similar pattern, it flipped definitively in 1988 and has been democratic ever since. It's now the third most unequal state. So it's ranking dropped from 15 to third. New Jersey moved up from 35th to seventh and flipped to democratic in 1992. And Connecticut from 37th to 23rd and flipped. It's now the sixth most unequal state. And even Nevada, uh, which was a Republican state up until 1988 and, and, and continued to be until 2004, uh, flipped at that point and has been democratic consistently in the last three elections. Uh, so uh, there's a pattern which you um, yeah, as I say, quite, quite consistently across the country, some power ex uh, just explaining uh, what is going on. Uh, so final thoughts, and I think I'm at my 45 minute uh, uh, moment here, uh, but 
uh, the inequality measures are not a fully precise way uh, to explore the, you know, the structural changes in the U.S. economy, but they do illustrate uh, a fair amount of what is going on, uh, in particular, uh, economy which over, over the last few generations has become entirely dominated by finance on the East Coast, technology on the West Coast, and the decline of a previously strong manufacturing center in the upper Midwest. Uh, which goes back to the early 1980s and to the, the Volcker recession and the Reagan, Reagan policies at that time. Um, and what has then happened is that well, you still have uh, these sectors which are uh, uh, highly competitive in the world economy, advanced technologies, aviation, and the financial sectors. Uh, they are employ a relatively small number of people, have in extraordinarily um, high incomes and concentration, therefore concentration of income, uh, and they've generated an economy which for the rest of, of, of employment is largely service-based. Uh, and I would argue uh, that that is, creates a, a very deep and uh, if not unique, uh, because Europe has some of the same issues, but exaggerated uh, vulnerability to the, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in particular, because the advanced sectors are, uh, first of all, they don't produce things that, uh, you know, like face masks and uh, that have, have immediate utility to the population. And in fact, supply chains for great many civilian goods are disrupted. Uh, but the main thing is that they support a world market for investment goods at a time when nobody needs investment goods. Nobody needs new aircraft. Nobody needs uh, any number of things that the U.S. is producing. And that problem will not be solved. Uh, by, uh, let's say, by traditional Keynesian stimulus policies. Uh, and second, and the, secondly, on, uh, on the financial side, uh, you'll have a vast accumulation of unpayable debts, which is surely to build up into a, a crisis of the financial sector sooner or later. Uh, and then on the everything else with respect to service employment, uh, the fact is that those jobs are in a country which is truly you know, still effectively quite wealthy and has a large buildup of of, uh, of, uh, of housing and other amenities for the much of the, of the economically important population, uh, services are dispensable. And people will not, uh, they will not be viable so long as the pandemic is underway, but they will also not be viable afterwards uh, because uh, the fact is people are going to be with their anxious about their own employment prospects, There's their precautionary savings go way up. Uh, and they will not then patronize establishments, even if they feel it's more or less safe to do so, uh, because of the um, need to conserve resources and things basically that uh, that they can do in the in the comfort of modest comfort of their homes, uh, and from which they've been basically induced to depart uh, by the growth of the service economy. Uh, so we're in a situation where, for a number of reasons, it seems to me that a much something much more comprehensive than a simple automatic stabilizer, simple influx of funds, simple Keynesian policy is going to be required. Let alone relying on the on on any supposed uh, natural resilience of the uh, of the market economy, which seems to me is we're in a situation where that is not there uh, compared to the Asian countries, which are solidly based in the manufacture consumer goods we are in deep trouble uh, as a result of the situation that we've developed over the last 40 or 50 years. So I think that's uh, basically what I had to say. Uh, the, the, the project has uh, uh, a very uh, international flair. Uh, all the work is, I, I, I merely uh, am the front man. Uh, the people who, uh, Jay He is from Korea, Beatrice Halbeck from France, Alexandra Malinowskis from Poland, Delfina Rossi is Argentine, I mean, Shams is from Iran and Vinjia Zhang is from China. Uh, we've been supported by the Institute for New Economic Thinking from time to time and also uh, by other, other, other sponsors and more distant removes. So that's enough for me for the moment. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Jamie. I knew when I asked you to give a sweeping talk that you would do a brilliant job. And thank you so much for a talk that started from a general introduction of your research program why are new ways of measuring inequality to the an analysis of inequality in election and right up to the most pressing political questions of the day, the US election and the pandemic. So thank you so much. Um, now is your chance to ask questions. Um, I would like to ask you all to um, 
write either your full question or simply stack in the chat box. Feel free to share your question in the chat box, but if you prefer, you can also just write stack um, to be um, basically raising your hand um, to ask a question. And I shall acknowledge at that point the um, help of two graduate students, Debra Manu and Pedro, who have been helping in the background um, to make all of this happen. So thank you to both of you. Okay. Um, now is your chance to ask questions. I'm looking at the box here. I can see that two questions already came in during the talk, so I will just start from those. The first one is from Ahmed Chaudhry. Ahmed, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Would you like to ask a question? Uh, yes, sure. Go ahead. So, uh, thank you so much for this informative talk. First of all, it was a pleasure listening to you. Can so you speak question... up a little bit, please? Okay, sorry. So I was saying thank you for this talk. And so my question is, in fact, I have two questions now. So, so the first question is that we see a pattern that particularly in the northern European countries, the inequality is relatively less as compared to the rest of the world. So and and we see that particularly these northern european countries have a mix of a capitalist and a socialist structure rather than having a pure capitalist structure particularly like the north american states so how can we sort of explain uh, that the economic structure being capitalist sort of favors the wealthy more as compared to the lower segments of the population and how this inequality is a sort of a deliberate process of of policies which favors the wealthy only. So, uh, like that was my question and comment. Like, uh, okay. and I wanted to know, like, what's your opinion on this? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I think it's a, a fairly straightforward story. Uh, that, and I and I, this will give me an opportunity to come up to bring back the. Uh, uh, the, the the one slide that I uh, that I neglected to leave in when I was editing this uh, to give you a view of the of the overall global trend that emerges in the data. Uh, this is uh, here we go. Come on. So if you look at our data. Uh, from the standpoint of the the, the whole data set uh, and and extract from it uh, the co movement of inequality within countries over time, this is the pattern you get, uh, and the pattern shows uh, a period actually when inequality is declining uh, from the moment basically of the breakup of the Bretton Woods system in the early 1970s until the turn of the of the decade, which marked the introduction of the of of of, of the uh, Reagan and Thatcher governments and the Paul Volcker policy of extremely high interest rates, which spread around the world, precipitated a global debt crisis. And things happen in about three phases here. Uh, you have a period here of the debt crisis uh, in Latin America and uh, parts of Asia. You have a period here of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the uh, socialist regimes in Eastern Europe, and then finally a period of Asian liberalization leading to the Asian crisis. It actually peaks out at around 2000, and from that point forward, with the exception of a of a of a peak at the crisis of 2009, uh, the afterwards is more has been more or less stable at least up until uh, 2010 or 11. Uh, so what's going on, I would argue, uh, is a, essentially the influence of the major trends of global finance in the, uh, oops, sorry, back there, uh, uh, beginning with the debt crisis of the uh, early 1980s. Uh, and the question then for countries that are, uh, you know, uh, that ones you mentioned is, why did they, why were they in a position to resist? And the answer is, first of all, they weren't that affected by the debt crisis. They weren't that dependent on global finance. And secondly, they were, uh, they had strong internal institutions, strong, strong trade unions, strong uh, institutions, uh, public private institutions, 
of social welfare states, which effectively stabilize the income distribution. And that's true for a very small number of countries of the, of the, of the wealthy and, and developed world. It's also true uh, to a degree for countries that, uh, that insulated themselves from uh, global finance, at least for a time. So for example, uh, China, uh, although it had major movements of inequality uh, in this period, uh, was not being driven by the global economy. It had been driven by developments inside China. Uh, and the, it was, it was uh, buffered from the global economy by the, the maintenance of capital controls, uh, which the Chinese did not dismantle in the 1990s, uh, and uh, therefore continue to be able to, to benefit from uh, basically an internalization of the developments of that country. India uh, did not uh, develop a rapidly rising inequality until after the reforms and liberalizations of 1992. Before that, it didn't borrow from the commercial banking system, but borrowed from the International Development Association and World Bank. Uh, and, uh, was, and, and you can see this in the Indian um, in income structure. 1992 was, of course, the turning point. Liberalization, financialization take off from that point forward. Uh, Iran, uh, which had a revolution in 1979, uh, was insulated from the d trends in the much of the rest of the world through through the 1980s. Uh, so one one can I think develop a pretty I think a pretty coherent story that countries which had weak institutions and were widely exposed to global finance are basically at the mercy of the kinds of trends we're talking about here. And there are some countries which uh, either by virtue of their strong civil societies or being buffered by, by effectively powerful and autarkic governments uh, have managed to stay out of this uh, trend. But by and large, the global trend is what drives inequality. And that again comes back to my, my, the thesis I was making at the beginning, which is that there's no separation between macro and micro here. You can't put just say that distribution is a function of, of marginal productivities in labor markets and capital markets or any other kind of locally defined uh, regionally bounded market structure. What's going on here are forces that are operating at the level of the world economy as a whole, based upon decisions taken in New York and London uh, and not very many other places. Uh, and uh, then we, we, the things that we see driving the macro economy are also driving the distributive structure. Actually, if you look at this and you compare it to inequality between countries, uh, Branko Milanovic's concept one, uh, they're essentially the same series totally different sources of information, uh, totally different things being measured, but they're, they're basically, what, when, when inequality and crisis between a rich country and a poor country, it's also gonna be increasing between the rich people and the poor people in many, many countries around the world. That's, that, that suggests that we do in fact operate. And the whole way we think about it, economic problems needs to be revised so that we're not modeling things at the national level, but thinking things, think about things operate at the global level. Thank you, James. We now have a question from Michael Ash. Michael, would you like to ask a question? Sure, hi, yeah, so that, thanks. It's a total, really wonderful uh, talk, thanks. Um, so my question is, uh, observers of the US scene, ranging from David Brooks to Thomas Piketty, have distinguished between one percenter, what you may think of as plutocratic inequality, and 10 percenter, kind of your basic sort of Rotarian or professional class inequality. Brooks fingers 10 percenter inequality as the main source of frustration and resentment. Piketty identifies one percenter inequality as the really pernicious part. Um, does the tile-based index distinguish between these? Do you have thoughts about the usefulness of the distinction? Is there one percenter inequality and more like, you know, professional class or petit bourgeois inequality? Um, well, things do correspond to each other in approximate ways. Uh, advantage of our approach is that I think our categories are actually much more stable uh, than this so far. We're looking at regions and within the U.S. case, we're looking at, at sectors within states so we have extremely detailed information that you're a farmer in Iowa or a college professor in Massachusetts, we can pick out your contribution to inequality uh, in the country as a whole. And chances are next year, you're still gonna be a farmer or a college professor. So we're looking at the same people. Um, 
that uh, gives us, I think, a lot of, and, and, and also it enables us to isolate uh, the specific places and uh, where, which are driving the inequality. Uh, one of the rather fascinating things that uh, one of my students some years ago calculated, uh, we, we were able to, to measure inequality in the United States across counties, 3,150 of them, using income tax data, uh, local area personal income statistics, and a contribution of each county to inequality. So I said, take the following exercise. Take the counties that contributed most to the rise of inequality uh, from 1993 to 2000 uh, and remove them from the data set. Right? Just substitute for their income number what it would have been if they just had the average rate of income growth. How much would of that measure of inequality go down? The answer is you take out five counties, it goes down by half. What are the five? New York, New York, three counties in Northern California, San Francisco, San Mateo, and Santa Clara. And one county in Washington State, King County, Microsoft. So, it's just, right. so I mean, it's just, it's, it, you can even name the people who are driving yeah. these income <laughs> tax numbers. Uh, so, uh, what you can't do with Piketty, uh, if, you, if, you, if you play this as the 1%, well, the 1% of tax filers changes all the time. Uh, and there's some, some people are up some years and they're down some years. Uh, there, you know, you can move up into the 1% once in your lifetime and not necessarily be all that wealthy all that all along. And depending on, you know, you win the lottery once, it's great, but you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, it, that, that turns you into 1% or but only for the year. Uh, so, uh, but with this kind of data, it really enables you to, 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 to pick out, uh, guess what region, if you look to the middle 2000s, the high point of George W. Bush, which region got the biggest increase in income? It's an area directly around Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia, uh, uh, Southern Maryland, right? All the Beltway bandits and the, the war profiteers. Uh, it was the greatest gift ever given by a Republican administration to a, to a network of Democratic homeowners. So they go, oh, household values went up dramatically. So you can, yeah, and then you can pick out, uh, uh, I mean, Shams did a beautiful map of the 2006-2007 period, and you could pick out the real estate hotspots uh, right, in Nevada, Florida, and so forth, which is very clear, Arizona, very clearly. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I, I, I dislike, I mean, the, the, the tax numbers are interesting, the Piketty numbers, the 1%, 10%. But they are not necessarily, there's not as though there's a reified group of people who are always the 1%. Uh, the 10% 10, 10 is probably a, a little more stable as that people tend to stay in that band. Uh, but again, I, in my mind, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not as clearly defined class and it doesn't tell you as much. What, what, what our work tells you is that this thing is really being driven by technology and finance. Uh, and so go, look for the bankers and look for the, look for the tech giants who are actually, of course, financed by the bankers, wouldn't exist otherwise. Uh, that's, where, that's where you have the commanding heights and that gives you a very specific idea of who they are, where they are, uh, and what forces are driving them. Uh, it's also, I mean, Piketty's data, to be an, just get another thing, Piketty does a lot, has a major international data set which I've gone through very carefully, and it is, I'm afraid to say, I have to say this bluntly, the worst of all of the major data sets. It's the least consistent with the others. We, we did this, there are working papers on our site that actually compare them, uh, uh, and it's also the coverage is atrocious. I mean, they will, they will tell you they have Nigeria, for example, and the, the data points for Nigeria, which were based upon some work by Tony Atkinson, which I'm sure was very good work, but it ends in 1959, and Nigeria didn't become a country until 1960. Uh, and 1959 is already, I think, even by our standards, Michael, quite a good, good time ago. It's a, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's a, uh, I, I can remember 1959, but I bet there are not many people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That was that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Good fascinating. Okay. Thank you, James. Uh, Gregor has a question that sounds related to me. So, Gregor, why don't you go next? Um, yeah. Hello, Jamie, and thank you very hey, much. Hey, Gregor. How are you? Yeah. Fine. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for this this very interesting talk. And um, I had a question that relates to. 
um, the relationship of changes in inequality and, uh, and whether Democrats or Republicans carry a state. Um, now, the tile measure is a measure of relative inequality, which is insensitive to the mean level of income around which incomes are dispersed. Um, does the mean income level at which relative inequality is occurring have any influence on whether a state is Democrat or Republican leaning? Uh, in other words, uh, you know, do the mean levels of income in the states also play a role for, for whether, um, um, whether one or another party carries the state and perhaps the inequality between states? Um, the motivation behind this question is whether states away from the coast, where I guess as a relative outsider, I may be wrong, but I think uh, incomes may be lower than at the coast on average. Um, but, but inequality may be rising too, and whether these are showing the same behavior um, as coastal states that you, that you showed quite well in your graph. Um, and I'm, I'm not states... sure I caught the whole... Yeah, sorry, oh, okay. Go ahead, sorry. Well, I mean, the, the yeah, provocative... I'm, I'm not okay, yeah, I'll just... I'm not sure I caught it all, but you can, if I miss something, you can, you can come back at me. Um, I think the main question was, what's the relationship between the inequality measures and the average income? Uh, yeah, and the, the answer to that is there is, of course, a relationship uh, because the average income is going to be higher in those more unequal states. Uh, it's the income income inequality is driven uh, in, in our measures primarily by the incomes at the top, not at the bottom. You know, large numbers of people who are working in the services sector. That's true everywhere. Uh, the services sector has. Uh, an amazingly flat income distribution. Basically, you know, you're looking at the difference between 10 and 15 or $20 an hour. That's not a very big uh, range. Uh, and uh, the incomes that are driving the inequality are all the, the incomes of, of much wealthier, much better paid people. Uh, so yeah, sure, the, the mean is going to be uh, correlated with the inequality measure. Uh, you could probably get a cruder version of what we're doing uh, out of the, um, uh, out of the, um, I'm just looking at average incomes, uh, but uh, it would be a lot cruder. And I think uh, there are a number of sort of interesting things that have cropped up in this. And one, one thing that appears to be significant in the inequality measures is that this is in kind of inequality that cuts the most in favor of the Democrats is inequality where you also have spatial segregation across political units. To say that you're, where you have essentially uh, rich towns and poor towns who are not in each other's hair, uh, and therefore the rich people are not so deeply concerned at the local level about suppressing the votes of poor people, uh, which in the south where people are, are are mixed in in the same large political jurisdictions has always been the issue, right? That, that, that the, the people who control the, the local governments don't want other people to vote, uh, and uh, so you have uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the the maxim that familiarity breeds contempt, uh, uh, or at least fear, uh, seems to apply here that that. It's easier for New York City, where you have five boroughs, some wealthy and some not so wealthy, to develop a coalition where everybody's in the same party than it is for uh, cities in which, in which the, 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 the administration is more, uh, let's say, uh, central. Am I allowed to, to follow up with a provocative uh, uh, follow-up on my question, which, which I didn't get to ask you initially? <laughs> mm -hmm. You can follow up quickly. Go ahead, sure. The quick follow-up is, um, do your results suggest that Democrats should push for more inequality to get reelected? Oh, it, it does it definitely suggest that, uh, that there's a kind of balancing factor uh, in American politics that uh, Republicans who pursue policies that greatly increase inequality uh, tend to generate elections that go to the Democrats. And when the Democrats pursue policies that Im that improve equality, then they then they generate they, what what emerges from that are people who vote Republican. Uh, now, uh, I'm afraid, unfortunately, that the Democrats have figured this out, uh, and they have, in under Clinton and under Obama, pursued policies that increased inequality, uh, and. Uh, you know, eventually, I mean, they did, and that, that, that strengthened their position, uh, but it eventually, of course, led to a, 
uh, you know, the phenomenon that we're seeing uh, in which uh, they, they narrowly lose the states on that, uh, uh, that, they, that they've neglected. And that is, uh, that's why we have Donald Trump. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Jamie. I'd like to call on Usmane Amadou next. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Well, to the extent that I can hear it all, I can hear yeah. you. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. My question is that the income inequality in the U.S. can it be um, attributed to political processes, or are there other reasons um, that could explain this inequality? I mean, uh, is it? Can, can we attribute the income inequality in the U.S. only to political processes, or are there other reasons? behind this inequality? Well, I, I think obviously political processes are uh, behind economic developments uh, in a important level. So uh, if you look at, this, at the chart that's still up here, um, the, uh, the, the events that precipitated uh, the onset of the neoliberal era, the, the debt crisis of the early 1980s, which was worldwide, those were political decisions. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, behind political decisions, there are economic developments. Why did they do this? Uh, they did this because uh, of an increasing conflict between capital and labor, uh, which they wanted to uh, uh, resolve in behalf of, in favor of capital, which they succeeded in doing. Uh, they did it because uh, of um, uh, they, um, I mean, in, in, in essence, the, the uh, in, industrial core of the United States was, was, was sacrificed to preserve the international position of the dollar. Effectively, that was what Paul Volcker did. And I did it because if you want to call it inflation, you can. That was the, the way economists characterized this, but it was really a deep political crisis, uh, which, uh, uh, which, as I say, they resolved, uh, but they resolved it by crushing the industrial heartland. Uh, and one can see, so one can say, it, yes, it's political. On the other hand, what's driving the changes in inequality are are the changes in economic structure. Uh, and therefore, you, you, you knock out the center and you end up with a, with a bimodal economy in which you have a small number of people who are uh, in regions that are extremely wealthy and large numbers of people whose living standards are maintained by the high value of the dollar and the fact that imports are cheap, right? And that uh, energy is cheap, food is cheap, clothing is cheap. China keeps the price of clothing down and uh, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union kept the price of commodities down, and uh, and so for the, this period, the real wages in the U.S. didn't collapse. Uh, the service sector, uh, although not well paid by comparison with manufacturing, people were not short of commodities uh, to buy any any dramatic extent. Uh, but the the gap between them and the, and the people who come to control the country is just enormous. So please, uh, one last question. What is your um, comment on innovation and entrepreneurship, for example, in income inequality? Do, do they have any role in this income inequality if you are able to, let's say, innovate to um, make innovation? Don't you think that it can also help um, people to, uh, well, to, I, I guess to, to be more um, innovative? Yeah, my view is there are two kinds of entrepreneurs. There, you know, there are many, many of them in this in small business in the services sector, uh, and they are essentially self-employed people who are uh, maybe making a little bit more than they would make in their, in, uh, you know, taking regular jobs. But they're they're also working themselves to death. Uh, you know, you can see that how the small business sector works in this country. Uh, those people are entrepreneurs for sure, but they're not going to become tycoons. Uh, and then there are people who do be celebrated, who become, who, 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 who come to the head of, 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 the, of you know, new companies in the advanced sectors and who manage to capitalize uh, their, their, uh, uh, their creations by floating them off on the stock exchange uh, and with the help of, of uh, investment banks and uh, hedge fund investors. Uh, and those people, of course, become the business celebrities. Uh, that's a, an intricate process, which is not as simple as simply being a very clever person. <laughs> you also have to have the right connections. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, a venture capitalist who will back you up at the start and provide you with funds. 
sometimes that's relatively easy. Most of the time, it's pretty hard. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, the next question is from Sam Levy, who has an issue with his microphone. So I will read the question to you. And the question is, can you comment on the impact of interest rates or monetary policy more broadly on inequality? Is this visible in the data? Oh, yeah. You look at this chart <laughs> for sure. Uh, and, and 1979, uh, July of 1979, Paul Volcker was named chair of the Federal Reserve, uh, and he immediately raised interest rates in September uh, to 20% briefly, precipitating a recession. In 1981, he raised them again and held them there for uh, uh, about 18 months. I was executive director of the Joint Economic Committee, and I, I had also been the architect of the Congressional Oversight of Monetary Policy. So I was a uh, sort of the, the leading adversary of this policy on Capitol Hill at the staff level at the time. Uh, but uh, it uh, uh, precipitated around the world uh, the debt crisis. That was a countries, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Peru, Chile, uh, all, uh, and all across Sub-Saharan Africa and in Southeast Asia had, bought, had borrowed heavily from the US commercial banks. Uh, and uh, they were all borrowed on, on terms that were adjustable uh, and the loans could not be refinanced. Uh, so it was a, uh, on the global scale, essentially replication of what had happened to New York City in 1975, 76. Uh, a massive uh, reduction in their import capacities, massive deindustrialization replacement, forcing them out of the previous strategy of development, which was import substitution effectively into uh, back to commodity exports and exports of whatever niche products uh, they, could, they could hang on to in that situation. Uh, and that led to, uh, well, a decade, two decades of, of depression, but effectively enormous rises in inequality. Uh, one of the things you can track uh, in, uh, and we did this for a paper on Mexico and Brazil, uh, it's very detailed data was that the rise in inequality in the wage structures of those countries is exactly uh, related to the growth rate. If the growth rate was above 3%, uh, then uh, the labor force was being absorbed and the inequality tended to diminish. Once the growth rate fell below the population growth rate, the inequality just went up and up and up. And that's what happened in the 80s and 90s across the, across the developing world. Uh, so yes, uh, the monetary policy or say, and the financial policy is what's driving this. It's the monetary policy regime. And that regime is set by the central bank of the countries that control uh, the currency in which uh, financial transactions occur. It's mostly the dollar, a little bit the, uh, the pound. Uh, the euro, not so much at the outside of the eurozone proper uh, and practically nothing else. Thank you. Um, we now have a question by Carol Heim. Carol, would you like to pose your question, please? Sure. So I think you may have partially just answered this question, but I wanted to ask, uh, what do you think are the most important policies now to reduce inequality, both in the US and globally? You've just talked about monetary policy and exchange rates. Are there other policies that you think are the top priority now for reducing inequality? Oh, I mean, I, I think uh, broadly speaking, you have to control the mechanisms whereby inequality is generated. So the whole, the whole structure of the global financial system needs to be taken back and put back under control. Otherwise, every time you, you make progress, uh, as, as ha has happened, um, it's very clear after 2000, uh, and you can, again, you can see this on this chart, uh, there is a general uh, uh, peaking uh, and and, and, and declines in inequality, we observe them in Latin America, was very substantial in Brazil, uh, in Argentina, uh, following the crisis there. Uh, it was, uh, uh, it's also substantial actually, and again, outside of the control of the global finance, but China peaks and, and, and what's happening there is the expansion of uh, economic activity outside of the initial region. So places like Fujian and, uh, and Xinjiang and, uh, and Tianjin and so forth are, are, are catching up and that gives you a, a, a diminution of inequality. Um, and in Russia, uh, the Russian Federation in the last 20 years, the inequality that skyrocketed uh, in the 1990s has been brought to a degree under control. 
uh, still much more unequal than it was in Soviet times, but it's, it's, it's not in the kind of grotesque situation of the 1990s. Um, and so, but every time this happens at the global level, you're vulnerable to, a, to an, another financial crisis if you don't have control of the financial system. And that's, of course, what's happening, happening in Mexico. It happened, it's been happening since about 2014. Uh, everywhere in the developing world, you have a series of, fun, of, 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 uh, of exchange rate crises, which are bringing exactly the same pressures to bear. Uh, so in the US, uh, there, there are all kinds of institutional strengthening that can go on. I mean, obviously, a, a, a much higher minimum wage and a, a stronger support for trade unions, some support for trade unions. Uh, and all these things that would uh, that would that would help, uh, but ultimately, uh, they the the problem here is 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 a problem of having a, a world dominated by a small number of, of private financial institutions, uh, and uh, that that world was in effect brought under control for about forty years from uh, nineteen forty to, to to the middle nineteen seventies, uh, but. Uh, we lost that, uh, and until we get it back, we're not going to we're not going to have any permanent, uh, long-lasting uh, ability to 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 control the situation. And I think focusing on that is, you know, of course, really important. It moves the discussion away from these very vague notions of uh, skill bias, technical change, and uh, you know, the race between education and technology, and all this kind of labor market uh, ideas, which are are rooted in a microeconomics of supply and demand. I said, no, it's not that at all. It's, it's a macroeconomics of financial control. Thank you. Um, then we have a question by Frank. Frank, would you like to ask your question? I don't think we can hear you, Frank. Oh, can you hear me now? Um, yes, but only very vaguely. Can you speak up a little? Um, I can hear. Okay. Uh, so I had two kind of questions for you, Professor Galvin, and thank you for your talk. Um, so your father said in American Capitalism, 1956. 52. 52, sorry. I just <laughs> had the essential Galbraith. Uh, anyways, in principle, the American is controlled, livelihood and soul, by the large corporation. In practice, he or she seems not to be completely enslaved. Given the muzzling of the Bernie Sanders campaign uh, and his powerful critique of corporations and finance, um, are we at a point where we're completely enslaved, especially considering how corporations manage to reflect certain social policies pursued by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party being what it is? And then my second question would be, uh, does pragmatism, without a strong critique of science proper, and not the same critique emerging from critical theory, provide a solution to the present predicaments we find ourselves in. Okay, I'm not sure I, I, I grasp the second question. The first one though is important to place in historical context. When I wrote that book, it was a period, the, the, the post-war, uh, uh, you know, a apogee, if you like, of, uh, of American corporate power. Uh, the major industrial corporations of the United States were world dominant at that point, uh, and the major fear uh, in the even 15 years later in the 1960s uh, of the Europeans was that they're going to be taken over by American multinationals. Uh, I don't think that's the world in which we live in now, and I don't think my father would would, would say so. It, what happened from the 1970s onward was a, a reassertion of the control of finance. Uh, and a gutting in many respects of the industrial power uh, of the American, uh, major American corporations. A few continued to survive at the very cutting edges of technology. Uh, but one of the things that happened was that the technological core of major industrial companies actually separated out and became their own, their own corporations so they could be capitalized separately in the financial market. So Bell Labs moved to California, essentially became Fairchild Semiconductor, and then the various fair children, Intel and so forth, and the technology sector emerged from that. Um, now, I would argue uh, that if you look around the world, uh, the countries that did not have that evolution, that maintained 
uh, and essentially, if you like, Galbraithian structures of their industrial corporations are, are the ones um, that now dominate the world industrial scene. And there are four of them that are worth mentioning. There's, uh, there's Germany, uh, which uh, has maintained the uh, uh, industrial strength and technological strength of its major machinery and automotive sectors in particular. Uh, so it becomes a supplier of engineering products to China and the world. There's Japan. Uh, which uh, in spite of having had a, a period of financial crisis still has extremely strong and in advanced industrial and technical sectors. The Republic of Korea. Uh, and the fourth one is the People's Republic of China, which comes from, interestingly from the other side of the ideological divide. And Isabella's work and my own experience tell you that in fact, they're well aware of, of, of the uh, arguments my father was making in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, but uh, but the, 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 if you look at the core industrial core of the Chinese economy, it, they're state-owned enterprises, but with a substantial degree of autonomy and, and many of the of the countervailing forces that uh, that uh, that uh, characterize the U.S. economy in the 1950s. Those character those countervailing forces are not here anymore. Trade unions are not there. The consumer movement is extremely weak. Uh, the political classes are captured by finance. Uh, so we are in a we are in a much more unstable and fragile, non-resilient, uh, and uh, and it shows in terms of their dependence on imports for so many vital project uh, products. That's your first question, and now your second question is completely out of mind. So I don't know if I'll ask you to repeat it, but okay, uh, maybe if I could just ex uh, explain a little bit more. Um, John Dewey kind of associated um, progress with the development of technology and science. Um, unfortunately, maybe he per perhaps forgot to foresee uh, how science and technology can enslave us and, and maybe take us to where we are today. I mean, does pragmatism exist in a world without uh, a solid critique of those kind of forces within science and technology? Uh, that okay. I got I got the question, and I'll just say I think it's over my pay grade. Uh, I'm not I'm not even sure how I would begin to answer it. But thank you for it. Okay, thank you. Then we have a question from Alicia Idelite Garen Gonzalez, and apologies for the terrible pronunciation. Alicia, would you like to ask your question, please? Yes. Let me put my headphones. <laughs> no, well, it isn't a question, Jimmy. It's that. Uh, Alicia. Hi, how are you? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Very nice to meet you by Zoom. <laughs> well, um, all of the, your conference, uh, well, it's uh, inequality is uh, close to the financial station since the 80s, since all the change of the American financial system, and also with the Washington Consensus. And not uh, and all the stability programs that the International Monetary Fund have, uh, uh, have, have uh, realized in Latin American countries. If you see Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico, that are the three principal countries in our, in, in, in our continent, is it, it is a result of all these uh, changes. And I think we have, uh, of course, is that neoliberal era, but we have also one of the inputs that we have to put uh, here is that in the corporate, as your father said in the, I was seeing the chat, of course, the corporates have changed the way they use finance. And that's why you have a big gap between the very rich uh, people and all the society. But it is terrible because at least in Mexico with our new government, we continue with the austerity. And it is incredible that they even can renegotiate the external debt, even they just can't um, put another, uh, another policies that improve employment. So this employment, because employment has also changed, so inequality for me and the conference that you have uh, uh, just um, uh, talked is that 
inequality is related with the financiation and also with the, all the austerity programs. It's like a big package that I don't know how it is going to change. I, I just can't believe maybe if the big corporates will improve in going to a green economy or trying to, and also the governments to, to put more investment in education and to improve the infrastructure. It is very hard to see a, a, a better future, at least in Latin America. Well, that's well, I can't say I just I can't say I disagree with anything you've just said. So, <laughs> so, so what we can? What's the future of our world? I, I just can't imagine a new change in this type of capitalism. And I think maybe it has. Well, to uh, okay. Can I imagine a change? Yes, I think a change has to come. Uh, and I, uh, the argument I would make relates to what's, what we're going through now. Uh, there is a view in, of course, the, in the economics profession uh, about the, the evolution of things after an event like this. Some people say it's just a shock. When it goes away, the economy will bounce back. That's the administration's view. Mm -hmm. And there are others who say, well, it's a terrible shock, but we could make it help better by by basically pumping money into the economy and that will be improve things. That's the, that's the uh, if you like, the liberal or the democratic view. Uh, and I don't think either of them is adequate to the situation uh, for the reasons I gave earlier. Uh, the, the advanced sectors are not gonna recover until they are restructured and put to public purpose because the private purposes are not there anymore. Nobody's gonna buy an aircraft. Just for example, I mean, there are half of them or more are sitting on the ground. They're perfectly airworthy. Why would you place an order for a new airplane? No, nobody's going to do that. Not not enough to keep a keep either of the major manufacturers solvent. You can put money in them and make they can pay, make payroll for as long as the government is willing to bail them out. But that isn't going to restore their markets. Uh, and so long as people aren't flying, they're not going to happen. Uh, so that just for example, uh, you can go down the list: con commercial office buildings, re re retail uh, office, uh, retail space. All these things. These are these things are they, they belong to the past now. We're going to face this. And the second thing, as I said earlier, is the millions of people who are not employed in those sectors uh, are not going to be employed uh, until they, they and, until everybody else is employed. So unless you create uh, a uh, basically public and uh, public jobs on a massive scale, uh, people are not, even when the virus goes away, they're not gonna venture out uh, to, uh, to go entertain themselves the way they have been in the last 15, 20, 30 years in the rich countries. So at some point, we're gonna have to recognize that things are gonna have to change. Obviously, it's not gonna happen uh, in this, you know, in the immediate aftermath of this election, uh, because even if, if, you know, if the incumbent is reelected, they'll just go on. Uh, if they, if 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 uh, Vice President Biden is elected, we'll get essentially the same ideas that were pro that that were put into effect in 2009, and those will have to be the inadequacy will have to be demonstrated. But it will be, in my view. And so, at some point, you've got to, some something new has to happen. Uh, you can't go on like this indefinitely. Uh, uh, that, would, that would be my my. My picture now it is kind of bleak because it says things will get worse before they get better, but in effect that's always true. It got worse from 1930 to 1933, uh, and then something happened. Eventually, something has to happen. Otherwise, otherwise, you know, I mean, it's other possibility is that the that the the leading positions of the world economy will simply shift, uh, and that's also possible. The countries that are that, that deal with this successfully uh, will end up in the leading position and will form a, effectively a working coalition and everybody else will be left to fester until they figure it out. Uh, that's also a distinct possibility. Wouldn't rule that out for a minute. Okay. Thank, thank you. you so much, Elisa and James. I think this was a perfect ending yeah. to this workshop. And in fact, time is up. Um, so thank you so much, James, for joining us, joining the UMass Political Economy Workshop this time. And thank you everybody for zooming in from around the world. It's been a great, great pleasure to have this discussion that I think is extremely timely in light of the various um, challenges that we are facing. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure to have a chance to talk to you. I just enjoyed it very much.